still gotta I got I still gotta go see Thor. Yeah, man. I still I need to finish Miss Marvel. Oh yeah, definitely. That's right. All right, John, take us to uh All right. Yes, so required viewing is our new thing where we rotate and one of us basically assigns a movie to the other two fellas so that next mm. time we get together, we, we all have at least seen something that we can see because so often we, it's hard for us to get on the same page with differing schedules and differing attitudes about going into theaters and all that stuff. So yeah. uh, my pick, based on the fact that we had been pre previously talking about the movie Thief as sort of a, a tribute to uh, recently departed actor James Kahn. And I was thinking about him and I had been watching the show. I'd been laying around sick watching the show, The Offer on Paramount Plus and thinking about Godfather being like a, you know, a great James Kahn role, but also a rare movie that had a, uh, a sequel that, that's considered a classic. And then I started thinking about classic films that had sort of unlikely sequels or sequels much later. And then I just instantly thought about Psycho 2 because Psycho is one of those giant this movie sort of spawned a, a genre in, in yeah. a way. Um, and the book it's based on as well, Al Alfred Hitchcock will say it all comes from Robert Block's book, Psycho. But um, it was just sort of a mid-century imagining of what a killer could be and the psychology of, of that era was feeding into this idea of like, you know, getting into the mindset of a killer, which now we know is the, like, not just a genre. <laughs> it's like, it's it's half of the, you know, bookstore if you go in. Uh, every book <laughs> is sort of trying to go for that kind of like... There's a reason why you'd talk to a killer to catch a killer or, or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, so Into the Mind of a Killer, uh, Psycho, ends with, uh, you know, this sort of feeling like it's a movie that doesn't need a sequel. And it's maybe in an era where they didn't make sequels willy-nilly to every little horror movie that came out. And then 20-odd years later, the movie Psycho 2, uh, directed by Richard Franklin, who's kind of a disciple of Hitchcock's, and written by uh, Tom Holland, not Tom Holland, who plays Spider-Man. Uh, but uh, a much older man who also wrote and directed Child's Play and wrote the movie Cloak and Dagger. Uh, so a guy who's who's all over the era of film. And if you know, if you're kind of a film geek, he's probably touched a few things that you enjoyed. Cycle 2 was also uh, the cinematography is by Dean Cundy, who is like, I mean, look at the movies he's done the, the, the photography for, like Jurassic Park, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Halloween, The Thing. Um, those are just some of my favorites, but you know, there's tons. So this movie has like a pedigree. Psycho Two is th there was an a, there was a possibility when they started making this movie that it was going to be a sort of direct cable sequel that wouldn't that maybe have even at one point had Christopher Walken uh, in the role of Norman Bates. Um, yeah, I saw that on the Wikipedia. Oh no! But instead, the screenwriter and the director said, "Let's write a role strong enough, a script strong enough that gives Anthony Perkins a reason." to want to come back to this this character, which he has at times said kind of ruined his career. Prior to Psycho, he was seen as almost like a, a, a young romantic lead. And yeah. then after that, he was everyone's favorite weirdo. Mm. So um, it kind of gave him a career and killed his career. So for Anthony Perkins to actually want to come back, they were like, that's the benchmark of this movie's success as a script. That's when it got, you know, it got, okay, now we're going to announce this as the, the, the big sequel to Psycho. We're going to put it in theaters. It kind of saved the movie when they got uh, Perkins on board. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's where I'll throw it to you guys. I, this was my first time watching this movie since seeing, I think this is one of those I saw in bits and pieces throughout my childhood on cable, but I never had sat down to watch the whole thing. And I think because when I was young, this is exactly the kind of horror that freaked me out, the sort of remote place. Uh, weird little hotel, you know, you're walking around to the ice machine and somebody jumps out from behind the building and kills you kind of kind of murder scenario. Um, yeah. And also when I was a little kid and I was like very skittish about things, my grandmother, I sometimes could get her to tell me the stories of like horror movies and episodes of Twilight Zone and stuff. And she told me this, she told me Psycho when I was a kid. And so I think before I had ever watched Psycho, I had probably seen Psycho 2 was coming on television and you know, was was at an age where I was thinking maybe I'm kind of interested in watching this horror stuff. But I still, I, I I stayed away from Psycho Two until I just watched it. So, yes, I, I will happily hear some of your input on this. 1983, definitely a, a in the middle of all the slashers that are coming out. So they're they're yeah. competing a little bit in terms of that. You know, trying to yeah. do some gore. What do you think, Rob? Alfred Hitchcock. This director is not. Uh, and that's kind of what you get very early is like, you know, his his stamp, his style is so distinct. And and, and by that, I just mean like, I think, I, I don't think I 
I think I took for granted how special he was. I know that sounds strange because he's so praised. I I did not appreciate it until, you know, I'd say within the past five or six years, how special of a director he was. And uh, Psycho was such an iconic movie. You know, this one's tonally is just not even in the same planet. But there's something kind of fun about it, you know. It, it feels like it's 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 crazy. <laughs> it's real crazy. Like it really like. So one of the cool things about it is Norman Bates really maybe talked to five people in the original, and this one he talks to maybe fifteen people, and it's it's really interesting to see how uneasy and how weird he can be, and the choices that he makes and the things he says, and I. I couldn't help but think, man, this is fun as hell the whole time. Like it, it felt a little long, but overall, I kind of enjoyed it. I I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I yeah, can't it was believe campy. That I did. Like some some of those aspects of his performance were kind of campy. Yeah. It, it, but I do, yeah, it is it is like trying to do something more heightened than yeah. you would think. It's, it's almost so got heightened. a touch of satirical yeah, attitude yeah. about what it's doing. Um, yeah, what I think the you, whole Steve? I think the whole time and like you just have this it, it kind of sort of what, <clears throat> what Ronald was getting at, like in terms of whatever however you feel about Psycho and its legacy and Hitchcock and his, you know, filmography. But like the approach to the to the filmmaking of this sequel, it definitely felt like it was more intentionally trying to um like misdirect a lot of times, like more obviously uh misdirect. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of the stuff that's being planted in the film that kind of make you question um norman sanity again and you know who are all these other people like you mentioned ron all the players in this movie you know the, the moving parts um you know and as the movie comes along it, it you know you start to be reintroduced to characters that you met earlier so like there's this idea of like a lot of red herrings and like there's there's more you know the idea of what psycho was and like probably maybe one of the ultimate red herrings it's like this movie kind of was moving like four of them at a, at, a, at any given time to try to make you question whether or not, you know, Norman Bates was slipping back into his, uh, his former ways. But um, yeah, I mean, like I said last week, I remember watching this a lot when I was younger <clears throat> or like a teenager, like I feel like it was always on like USA or something. And I, and I think it's fun. Like you said, it, it's, it's, it's not psycho. It's kind of, you know, kind of sillier, a little definitely campier. Um, not 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 campy or silly to like a any degree where like I feel like it's like laughable and at least in my opinion. Um, There's one but, moment that 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 is to me is is a funny moment, and I think they must have known it was funny, and that's the moment where she's being like she's just being his mother, and he she's cradling him, and he's talking about the toasted cheese sandwiches. Yeah, which by the way, Tom Holland, I read an, or I heard an interview <laughs> with him where he said it, for him it was grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> it, that that was in the script was grilled yeah. cheese, but the director, being Australian, did not know that phrase and changed it to toasted cheese sandwiches because he oh. thought audiences would understand that more. But the re the writer was saying he thought for any American, grilled cheese would be the the reference yeah. because that's yeah. what your mom makes you. And he said this really kind of beautiful thing. He said that sandwich is comfort. That's the yeah. sandwich your mom makes you when you're hungry and she needs to whip something up in five minutes, or when you've been hurt, or when you come home from school and you're kind of sad. You know, like that's yeah. the unit of expression of a sandwich. But that yeah. scene where he's talking about that and then he says that they took everything away from me my memories and he pauses but and he not. says but not those sandwiches <laughs> yeah <laughs> they yeah, had to yeah. know that moment was kind of funny but i also think there's sincerity <laughs> to your point steve there's sincerity in the way that campy moment unfolds. yeah totally yeah um but yeah i don't know like you know i, I it's pretty much you know the experience re-watching it again was pretty in line with how i remembered it um i feel like meg tilly kind of stood out a little more to me uh this rewatch um, right, what she's because, doing right exactly yeah like kind of the like her her play and the whole thing especially with you know what her, what her and her mom are doing initially and then kind of what it pivots to um but yeah i don't know like i it, it's, it's a fun it's a fun kind of campy sequel to psycho which sounds crazy but then you go watch psycho 3 and you're like oh, this is like actually a pretty good bridge to like how yeah. kind of crazy psycho 3 gets yes um but um, it, it's a lot more in line with maybe what the first one was doing. Um, Psycho 3 is directed by Anthony Perkins, by the way. It is, And yeah. it is a very, talk about, Ronald, you're talking about the sort of directorial flourishes. 
like this movie has whether it can match Hitchcock's style or not that definitely with like the the, the mood of that house the shadows the, right. the color like the it's yeah. it's a really it reminds me of some of my favorite slasher movies just in terms of how much there are all these pockets of darkness and that is a creepy yeah. house and it's a creepy setup oh yeah what I like sure. about three is that it really pays off what seems to be what, what's going on at the end of Psycho Two yes. is the new setup, the new normal of three, and it's a really fun sort of reveal slash relationship that he has with the uh, the the new corpse in town um, that that he creates at the end of this movie. But I think that moment in the kitchen is an all time moment for me when when he seems to be poisoning someone's tea, but instead he's going to use something else. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that moment really was just like a great jolt that the movie kind of needed towards the end. And it almost gives it this kind of demonic feeling that you are watching a movie that doesn't so much side with the killer. But Norman is, you know, he's kind of the victim slash hero of Psycho 2 in a way that in the first one you can't say is the case. Yeah. And all those red yeah. herrings you're talking about Steve that's another thing Tom Holland talked about uh, was just how much he worked to make it work he said he got to the end of the script and he wanted you to see how all the red herrings all the how could someone have been here when someone else was here well when Norman was locked in this room how could someone else be down here that he he made sure to make all that work whether right, it's whether right. it's heightened and campy or not the whodunit aspect of it actually is interesting like it does like you could be starting to get bored you were you were saying it was kind of slow there's about three quarters in where you're like this is taking a little time but i want to see what's going on because i still don't know you know what i mean they don't answer yeah. all the questions until basically the last moments of the movie yeah and i think that is a fun almost a callback to the way the first one had that sort of twist that now we all know but the twist of like what's actually happening sure. um norman's weird relationship with his mother being the root of his his tendencies and I think this movie does do like a, a halfway job of being that that eighties style sequel that where there's all these cute references to the other one, but um, more so, yeah, just an effort to like do something legitimate, which I think is an interesting thing. This movie was reasonably successful too for its budget. It cost about five million and it made um, you know about thirty five million, so not, not a huge success, but enough to get a Psycho three. Um, and one thing yeah. interesting also that Tom Holland said, he said that Anthony Perkins doesn't give a shit about narrative. He said every shot for him is about like the emotion, like as, an, as almost like an art film about the emotions mm. of the character and the mood of the moment. And so he said that you can see that in this movie a little bit, like with some scenes where you're yeah. like, what's happening here? Why is this scene right now? But also he said in, in the direction of three, you can totally see like that Anthony Perkins is obsessed with mood, um, which I don't know, just sounded kind of, kind of interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just watched three after this because I couldn't resist, and uh, I'm probably going to watch Psycho Four too, um, just to kind of finish up my thoughts about the, just the, their attempts to do this to like say, oh, this was a classic film, but now it's the '80s and horror films get sequels every couple of years. Let's do it, right? You know? Right. Um, it's like you break the seal and then you can't stop making them. <laughs> yeah. For sure. <clears throat> yeah. So. There it is. Also, Robert Loggia not playing a um, Robert Loggia not playing a, a like a tough guy. He's playing a like a. I kept waiting for his accent to become sort of uh, you know, but he was very right. like he, he was this doctor. He was very uh, Norman. Yeah, you know, he'd been, he'd been <laughs> taking my advice. What a change, man! I was expecting him to um, talk to Tony about cocaine or something like that. I know exactly. Very like yeah, I don't know. I enjoy coming drunk or something, you know. Or, I don't know.